As every year, I have the pleasure to introduce my good friend, my brother, my business partner, uh, Peter Bryant, known to all of you as Peter, known to me as Peter. Uh, and, uh, and so I'll let Peter introduce our opening keynoter, our good friend who's returned a few times to be with us at Twin, Mr. John Hickenlooper. Peter, the floor is yours. So I might use the lectern. So, actually, as I look up here, I know how the gladiators feel. So I'm lucky you don't guys have uh, rotten fruit or anything. So it's a re I'm really excited about uh, introducing uh, Governor John Hickenlooper. Uh, I've got to know John over the last 10 years, first as when he was mayor of Denver and then as a uh, two-term governor of the last eight years in Colorado. Uh, and I had the opportunity to get to know him through several initiatives we worked on, and uh, in particular, uh, the founding and uh, establishment of the Colorado in Innovation Network, which was actually inspired by Kin uh, some eight years ago, uh, and, and really was one of the foundational pillars of the economic blueprint that Colorado had. And I think what John achieved in eight years with Colorado and his administration, because I know he wouldn't take personal credit, is that Colorado is really at the bottom of the quartile for performance in the states, uh, and right now it's considered, if not number one, in the top five states in performance. And I'm not just talking about economic performance, I'm talking about social and environmental performance, uh, which is not an easy thing to pull off on those three levers. Uh, and not only that is uh, he's made Colorado, especially Denver, a real magnet for young people. And it's not just the legalization of marijuana that's done that, I believe. I think there are other things. Uh, and it's really got a vibrant startup community. It's I, I went there in 96. Um, I, I served on the coin board for several years before I moved to California and I think, I think John, you've forgiven me for moving. Not, not always really sure. No, it's not forgiven. But the relationship has endured nevertheless, so that's really good. Um, also, a few weeks ago, uh, it was announced that John uh, created a pack called Giddy Up. So that, I think, speaks volumes about who he is. Uh, and Giddy Up is designed for him to explore seeking the Democratic nomination for running for President of the United States. So that's awesome. You know, it's, a, it's a serious endeavor and one that I'm very excited about. And John, you have my support, I'm for sure. Um, I think, you know, when you think that he's running for that, I think it really demands kind of serious inspection and consideration from people, no matter where you are. Because when I think about what he's achieved, more importantly, how he's done it, and the trust and loyalty that he engenders in people around him and uh, is pretty amazing and pretty unique uh, in the current environment. When he and I were having lunch a few weeks ago in Denver, we were talking about you know, this conference and his theme. We talked about the importance of trust, and your know, trust between people, trust between our people and the institutions that govern us, trust between institutions and government. And we are not able to achieve those kind of new horizons that we seek unless we have trust. If there's no trust, we minimize the prosperity that we have. So I think the theme of uh, John's talk is uh, very germane about you know, government and collaboration at the speed of trust. So uh, please join me in welcoming the Governor of Colorado, John Hickenlooper. Uh, it is a little gladiatorial, <clears throat> I have to admit. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the uh, kind invitation and, and Rob for inviting me. Uh, I am honored to be a Twinian uh, and have watched this organization grow and evolve. Uh, and it is true that, that Trust is in short supply in, in so many arenas, uh, and increasingly not just in the United States. Uh, and it requires a level of rigor that not everyone's willing to commit. Uh, and it, it, even with that determined effort, it's fragile. And oftentimes, even in science, I have a master's in geology. I think I'm the only practicing geologist in the history of America that's been elected a governor. I'm not sure what that says. Um, but even in, in, in every science, people are constantly debating the facts. Uh, one time I got in a fight with my son, Teddy, who at that time was 10. We were, doing, actually we were de dealing with gun safety. <clears throat> and I came home and made the mistake of complaining to a 10-year-old. He goes, Dad, what do you do at work all day that's so hard? Make decisions? And I go, well, Teddy, you know, decisions. He goes, Dad, get the facts, make a decision, check. Next. I said, well, Teddy, it's certainly not that easy. He goes, Dad, get, a, get the facts. Make a decision. Check next. Every day I've got to go into school and learn something completely new I didn't know existed the day before. If I don't get it completely right, my next day is misery because everything's based on the day before. After five minutes, 
I gave in. No, no question, fifth grade is harder than being governor. <laughs> uh, I brought a lot of the tools in terms of trying to build trust. Uh, I brought a lot of the tools in from small business. I, the pr price of oil collapsed in the, in the mid-1980s in Colorado, and our, our company got sold, everyone got laid off, and many geologists got laid off, and no one was hiring, so there were literally no jobs. And <clears throat> I was out of work for uh, almost two years, uh, and you know, at a certain point, it's, it's six, eight months, you begin to see a different person in the mirror than the person you've known your whole life, and some of the the, the most essential and basic confidences that you've had, you, you begin to doubt them a little bit. And so I uh, basically ended up opening a brew pub, the first brew pub in the Rocky Mountains, a restaurant that brews its own beer. Back when the rent in lower downtown Denver was a dollar a square foot per year. <laughs> Hard to believe now if you go, if you've ever, if you've been down there. Uh, and we built a business, and a, and a, a pretty large business we ended up opening brew pubs all over the, the United States, always in abandoned historic buildings, always in pretty much abandoned warehouse districts, but always in downtowns trying to build community. Uh, and that restaurant business taught me some of the basic essentials of trust. Uh, you know, I always wanted restaurant, the, the customers to know that the owner was going from table to table. If you want to have your clientele trust you, make sure you touch as many as you can. So, I'd, always, they'd, I'd say, how is everything? They'd, the customer might say, fine. I'd say, wait a second. My house is up as collateral for this place. Fine isn't good enough. And it was just a sleazy way of letting them know that I was the owner without having to beat myself on the chest. But it established that relationship. In the restaurant business, you learn that there's, there's no margin, there's no profit in having enemies. Uh, no matter how unreasonable that customer, you'll do everything you can to make sure they feel appreciated. That's clearly not the case in, in, in politics these days. Uh, our designer would, he designed the kind of the, 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 the high, high top tables and bar seats uh, so that on a busy night, you brush against strangers as you walked around finding a seat. And, and study after study shows when people have that incidental uh, contact, what my designer called friendly friction, uh, you would be twice as likely to, to talk to a stranger. And it has a huge part to do with how a lot of the, the accelerators and, and startup incubators succeed as they try and find places where they can create that friendly friction. That friendly friction creates an authentic connection with people, a conversation that, that is a foundation for good trust. We learned in the restaurant business that you, you never persuade anybody to change their mind about something by telling them why they're wrong and, and why you're right. The only way, and this has been true in my, in my 17 years in public service, the only way you persuade anyone is just by listening harder. And you listen again and again. If in the restaurant business, if someone's really angry, you get in the, in the habit of repeating back to them the exact words they're using. It's remarkable when people hear their own, their own language repeated, they in some essential way feel validated. And they get off of their dime and begin to look at things maybe from a different point of view. Uh, and I think... That's what we tried to do when I, when I ran for office. You know, I had all these, well, I had built a, best, a restaurant and I'd, I'd spent a lot of time being very intentional about the culture. And almost any culture that's successful is based on trust. And all those things I said were ingredients to build up that, that relationship of, of, of trust. Uh, you know, there are other things in the restaurant business that, you know, you have to be optimistic. Any entrepreneur knows this, but if you've got a, a team and you go in and you've been in a, a you've gotten a fight with your your spouse or your girlfriend your boyfriend and you're a little cranky, within three hours, the bartenders are cranky, the expediters cranky, the cooks are cranky. Uh, I got in the habit of there was a place in our vestibule where I could see my reflection, and I'd walk in there, I'd stop like like Bob Fosse, you know, in that in that movie, I'd say it's showtime, and I'd make myself I into a positive frame of mind. And amazingly enough, and, and, and really if you talk to people, it's not that surprising, you put yourself into that positive frame of mind and more often than not, you'll become happier. You'll, you will become <clears throat> that, that person you're, you're, you're trying to create. Uh, it turned out Kurt Vonnegut was an old friend of my father's and he told me one time that one thing you have to be very careful of who you pretend to be because that's who you're going to become. 
But in that, in that trying to create a positive environment, the one thing to remember is that you are always authentic with everyone so that you're able to, um, able to, 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 to build that trust. Uh, restaurants are great also. I'll, this is the last thing I'll say about restaurants. I could, I could talk the whole 12 minutes about restaurants. The other thing is that the, uh, the thing about restaurants is no matter when it gets busy, when, when you're in the weeds is what they say, uh, when it's really, really busy and you can't get the food out fast enough, it doesn't matter who you are, you're all in it together. It doesn't matter whether someone is tall or short or black or white or straight or gay, it is one team. Uh, and that is something that is essential, I think, for any team, but especially in, essential in politics. So I ran for... I took that kind of collaborative effort based on trust that we had in the restaurant business, and I got talked into running for mayor of Denver. And keep in mind that I was, you know, I was a skinny kid with acne. I had really thick, almost like the bottoms of Coke bottles for glasses. I mean, I didn't date when I was in high school. That's an awkward thing to say. But, <laughs> but the bottom line is, is that, you know, the, uh, when you when you spend your life talking your way out of fights and trying to bring people together and trying to be the convening force, that is a, um, a powerful way to build trust. And when we ran, you know, uh, we took the collaborative efforts um, that we did in the wine coop. And as I said, I mean, I, I'd never, I, I was a wallflower. I, I, never, I never ran for student council or class president or anything like that. I ran for mayor, first thing I ever ran for, and I won two to one. And largely because I, I did things no one else, else had ever done, I committed the city of Denver to work with the suburbs. Like most metro areas, Denver is 20% of the metropolitan area, and there's historically a battle, a war, going between city and suburbs. And I said, we will never be a great city without great suburbs. Therefore, if I become mayor, I will do everything I can to make the suburbs the best suburbs in America. Fast forward a year and a half, I won two to one got 60, 66 and a half percent of the vote. Uh, I, we, we went around to all the suburban mayors because we realized we wanted to have a transit system that would allow us to have economic growth and would be a, a, a magnet for young professionals, young entrepreneurs. So we, we created Fast Tracks, 122 miles of new track, largest transit initiative in the history of the country. And we went out and we got all 34 mayors in the metropolitan area, two thirds of them Republicans or independents, to unanimously agree to support a 0.4% sales tax increase to build this thing. So that was in 2004. We're just finishing building it now. If you ever get down to see Union Station in Denver or, or take the, the light rail in from uh, the airport, it is a thing to behold and has, has been a big key of our success. That collaborative effort with the mayors was the platform when I ran for governor. Uh, and again, that same, I said, the, the metro area is now going to be a partner with the rest of the state. No one had ever said that before. I became the first mayor of Denver to be elected governor of Colorado in 140 years. Uh, really just because people were aching to hear that collaboration. The city of Denver had pledged that we would share our senior water rights with the suburbs. No one could believe that I, that I would do that. And, and actually, they said I would never get reelected as mayor, for, let alone governor. But I got... The, 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 the hunger, the appetite within the citizens of Denver was so great for that. Not only did the suburbs kind of come on board, but I got reelected with 88%. I mean, that's, those are just facts that demonstrate this, that the bitterness and partisanship is, is not healthy. And certainly that, that lack of trust is easily transcended by a collaborative approach that, that, that reflects trust. Uh, we came in when we got elected. We, did what we called the bottom-up economic development plan. We went to all 64 counties, asked each county what they wanted for an economy 20 years from now, 50 years from now. What did they want the state to do to help them get there? We heard essentially the same things. Cut red tape and bureaucracy, more access to capital. Have the state be pro-business. We said we'd be the most pro-business state in America, but with the highest environmental standards, the highest ethical standards. Uh, the public, the, the, the 64 counties also said that they wanted to uh, celebrate uh, innovation and, and technology. They wanted the state to market itself not just as a destination for tourists, but as a place for a destination for entrepreneurs, a place to, to build not just a business but a life. Uh, and again, when I ran, I, I, I didn't win two to one. 
but I won by 13 points, which in 2010 was a kind of a red year. Uh, we considered that pretty, uh, pretty dramatic. Uh, and then we set out, once we had the economic uh, momentum going, and we were at that time, we were 40th in job creation in, in 2010. Uh, fast forward three weeks ago, US, uh, USA Today came out, and for the second year in a row, ranked Colorado the number one economy in the country. Uh, and along the way, we, we pushed trying to collaborate, not just on economic development, but also on, on some of the social issues and some of the environmental issues. Uh, we ended up brokering a deal between the environmental community and the oil and gas industry. And Colorado's one of the top five states for oil and gas. You don't think of it naturally, but along the front range on the eastern plains and, and on the far west slope, there's a lot of oil and gas. And we had a real, real problem, like almost every oil field in, in America, and, and most of them in the world, with fugitive emissions. And methane is 80 times worse than CO2 in terms of a climate, uh, in terms of damaging climate, a, a climate gas. And so <clears throat> we, we convinced the oil and gas industry to sit down with the environmental community. And this is Fred Krupp of the Environmental Defense Fund played a big part of this. And we talked to the CEOs of the largest operators of, in the oil and gas industry. And they, they wanted three things from me. The, the oil and gas people said, well, we're not going to do this because you're going to create a bunch of red tape and bureaucracy. And I said, wait a second. We've already gone through 24,000, almost every rule and regulation in the state. We've either reduced, uh, either, either eliminated or significantly reduced almost half of them. And they said, well, but, but you're going you're gonna to bury us in, you know, in costs that won't really have benefit, and, then, and we won't get any credit. And I said, well, here's my commitment. And we, and we spent an hour negotiating this. But, but basically, they would be in the room for every single decision. It would be their plan and the environmental plan. The you know, state government would just be a convener. And that we would make sure that, the, that the, the, the celebration was fairly celebrated, or the success was celebrated by both the environmental community and the oil and gas industry, and that there would be no red tape, and that every dollar spent would actually make the air cleaner. And again, <clears throat> they spent two months fighting over the science. You know, that's not real science. I know that, that study was wrong, but they had to compromise. We built up a level of trust. We didn't have a, an outline that we presented to them ahead of time, because then both sides think you're biased against them. We let, from the very first meeting, the, the, the scientists from both sides build everything together. And, and in the end, when we got, we, it took two months to get the science hammered out, and then another 12 months to, to create this set of regulations. Uh, but it was the equivalent cost the oil and gas industry, which they voluntarily spent, $60 million a year, but it was the equivalent of pulling 320,000 automobiles a year off the road permanently. And the regulations are actually being rolled out in Canada as we speak. I think they're going to be rolled out almost verbatim in, in Mexico, uh, either next spring or next summer. <clears throat> of course, Washington is being unpredictable. They're, they're being rolled back on the BLM land, the Bureau of Land Management. We're, we're not going to go there. We're, we're going to stay optimistic. We're going to look on what we want to see. Um, yeah. Um, last thing, I'll just finish up. And, and a big part of this was COIN, the Colorado Innovation Network, which is uh, modeled on, on KIN and modeled on TWIN, uh, of bringing together the most creative innovators and, and cutting across different uh, verticals and seeing within different industries how we get them to share each other. Uh, one of the things we took away from that, we've been organizing now for the last two years, the outdoor recreation industry, which no one knows this, but it's a, I mean, never been measured before. Penny Pritzker, when she was Secretary of Commerce, got the outdoor recreation industry to be measured economically. It's an $887 billion a year industry. It, it, it creates good health, creates jobs in rural areas. Uh, it is a, you know, there's nothing about it not to love, and yet no one had ever really worked on it. And, and fascinatingly enough, they'd never really gotten involved in politics until this whole issue with the state of Utah reducing the size of the monument. And they are now organizing in a nonpartisan way around clean air, clean water, public lands. And we've been pushing this as hard as we can and, and convening and, and, and working on it because I think right now, especially with millennials, but with many people, they're so frustrated by the partisanship of both parties that they're looking for other places to, to make progress and move forward. And I think that the next one, you'll, I'm sure you're going to hear about. These are companies everywhere that are, are really going to start pushing school board races, county commissioner races, uh, city council races, 
and try and get towards that clean air, clean water, public lands. As a frame of reference, the NRA has 5 million people, nonpartisan. They, it's all about the Second Amendment. It's nonpartisan. The uh, Recreation Equipment Incorporated, REI, has 15 million members, uh, so three times as many people. I'll finish with this because <coughs> sometimes it feels so hard to get the kind of collaboration done and to, and to really build trust sufficiently. I mean, you really, we do try to collaborate at the speed of trust. And I remember always when it gets hard to, to, about the story when I was first running for mayor and I, for the first six weeks, didn't, I stayed at 4% in the polls, no matter what I tried. There are five other candidates. And so I had to fire up my young volunteers and I had a clipping about a professor of public speaking at the University of Wyoming who was talking about the importance of using opposites when you, when you create emotion, when you speak. If you're going to talk about the worst of time, talk about the best of times in the same sentence. The agony, talk about the ecstasy. She asked her class, what's the opposite of despair? Kid raised her hand and goes, joy? She goes, exactly. If you want people to feel despair, use joy in the same sentence. Then she looked out and said, what's the, what's the, what's the opposite of woe? And the kid way in the back goes, giddy up. And, <laughs> and, and in, almost, in almost every case, the opposite of woe really is to giddy up and just, and just work harder. Thank you. Logistics. No, you stay put. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Right. He's worried about going off the side. I know. Can we take the dangerous side? No, no. <laughs> we're, we're a bit nervous up here, so there's uh, edges on both sides. So, uh, Great talk, enjoyed it. I was wondering where Giddy Up came from. Now I know. Yeah, that's, I, that's I, I, did, I did start a, a, a kind of a baby pack, uh, you know, what they call a leadership pack that, you know, you can only collect five grand only from people. Um, but we needed a name, so the pack is called Giddy Up. Giddy Up. It's brilliant. Great name. I love it. So, John, I mean, we often talk about, you know, intractable issues in society, and we've got a lot of those. And more and more people are talking that, you know, they're not, they can't be solved by just one organisational group, not government by itself. So they talk about you know, government, NGOs, companies collaborating. Where do you see government playing that role, particularly in an era of low trust? You know, how do you can drive that to tackle the issues that we face? Well, I, I think one thing... Oh, Jesus, that's loud. It is. Uh, one thing that is, if you really look at it, and I think this is true almost all over the country, that... If you try to pass a sales tax increase, a federal sales tax increase, no one's going to bite. You go to a state, on a state level, try and do an income tax increase sales, very difficult. You get down to the lower, to, to, to the municipal, uh, the counties, the, you know, the school boards, it gets easier. In other words, if we're going to rebuild trust, it's going to have, have to happen just like our bottom-up economic development plan where we're going to have to go down to the, to, the, to the really the grassroots level and empower them and be authentic. And, and, you know, we tried this when I got elected. Having been a mayor of Denver, I knew how frustrating it is to have the state come and say, well, you now have to do this safety measure and you have to put in all these things and you've got to have, you know, larger gutters around this or whatever, and there was no money for it. And so we made a, 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 an executive order that we would, we, would, uh, we would not have any unfunded mandates. We would not impose those on any uh, city, town, or, or county in the state of Colorado. And people loved it. And I think, that's, there's gotta, I think there's gonna have to be a renewed focus on going back to the local level and really listen to what people think they need to improve their own communities. Yeah, I think it's good. And actually, you mentioned the bottom-up uh, economic blueprint. I was fascinated when that came out. Uh, what was the reaction when you went out, because it had never been done before in Colorado. So what, what were corporate, the CEOs and the other people when you said, I want to do bottom up, what was the reaction and how did you get people to the table? Well, when we first talked about it, there was skepticism mm -hmm. that we'd actually do it. Uh, because it is, you have to go out and you have to go to the counties. And Colorado's a big state. Uh, we spent probably three, three quarters of a million dollars just in the process of going out and talking to everybody, bringing them in, listening to them, <clears throat> setting up websites, letting people get engaged. But the outcome was spectacular. I mean, we had more than more participation 
I think we got up to about 11,000 people. When we did our Colorado water plan mm -hmm. three years later, we got up to 30,000 people participating. You know, it's like a muscle. Yeah. It's like love. Love yep. is a muscle. It is. needs to be exercised, yep. get stronger. Uh, so does participatory, uh, you know, uh, democracy. So anyway, that, mm -hmm. there was skepticism. But once we came back with the six, basically we heard the same thing in all the six places, which I, which I said, you know, he's access to capital, get rid of red tape, market the state more as a business, uh, make the state pro-business, uh, innovation and, and, uh, innovation and, and, and uh, technology, celebrate, really push those. That stuff mattered to people. Yeah. And, and once we started showing what was coming out of it, there was universal. One of the most important things you can have in any enterprise or any initiative is unity. Yep. And people forget that, that how much easier everything becomes when you've got everyone pulling at the same time on the oars. Yeah, and I think you know, building and nurturing trust is an everyday activity, right? Yeah. You know, you've got to keep doing it. So I don't know if this is controversial or not. So you know John Hennessy, president of Stanford, now chairman of Alphabet. He was asked in an interview in the Wall Street Journal, uh, is there a role for government? Okay, and he was talking about technology, but he said there's a role for someone not sure if it's government, because the challenge with government is they operate so slow that he gets nervous about its ability in fast-paced times to actually respond in a meaningful way. How do you respond to that kind of reaction? Because I think a lot of people have that feeling, right? Well, he's right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> things are, are, are changing so rapidly, and all the processes by which we have uh, created government are, by their very nature, and I think almost by necessity, have to slow things down. Hmm. And yet you talk to Elon Musk or a lot of the big technologists, they feel we're already going too far in the creation of artificial intelligence and automation that, that if we don't begin to regulate artificial intelligence, the vested interests that control it will have so much financial power, they'll have, the lobbyists will be so strong that you'll never be able to regulate it. Yeah. And uh, I think he's right. But it's hard when you spend time trying to think, well, how do we make things go faster? How do we have zoning meetings where people... They only get one window to come in. If they don't know about it yep. and they don't show up, it's over. They don't get a week or yep. two weeks. You know, all these things are, w became slow for a reason, to include more people, to be in, to, to include more people in the process. So uh, no one I know has answered his question. But if it's not government that's going to convene people and help solve these right. problems, I'm not sure who it is. Exactly. So government needs to step up in a way. Well, go governor start. has to ask for more authority from the public. Okay. And, and to do that... Uh, again, we can use technology, we can have more diversity when we do processes of review and create regulations. I mean, we did the methane regulations. Mm. It took 14 months to do that. And yet, those regulations are now three years old. No one's trying to throw them out. The, the oil and gas industry, they weren't crazy about them, yep. but they're using them. And the environmental community didn't think we went far enough. But it's the, we're the only state in America that got methane regulations done. It just, but if we hadn't spent that time, I don't think they'd still be in place. Yeah. I mean, I think it's key that, you know, I think you know, our natural reaction in the US anyway is more government is, there's a visceral reaction out here. But I think if you engage people and they understand it, then they may consider a greater role, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. I, and again, you know, what he's talking about at Alphabet is, it's, it's, a, it's a serious, serious issue. It is, absolutely. So what I want to do is actually open it up. We'll continue our conversation, but are there any, uh, anybody in the audience? Uh, well, it's dangerous if we open it up to questions, I know. Uh, anybody? Yep. Uh, gentleman there, I can't see. And actually, uh, it's Dean. So Dean, go away. So, yeah, just, you got a mic uh, there. And just say who you are, where you're from. That's good. Quick. Yeah, D Dean Weiberg, um, formerly at uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. But, but I left and started a company, which I'm not going to go into now. Um, but the question I was going to pose, so I've been to a number of the uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Association meetings, COGA, and, and certainly they give good lip, excuse me, good uh, lip service, you know, to, I think, the message that you're carrying forward. But the question that I pose is, um, if, if government is too slow, are the professional or organizations and particularly COGA in this case, were they effective in being able to, to implement you know, the environmental changes and the regulatory changes that you had identified over the last 14 months? So, so once we went through the, that 14 month period, which I think was four and a half years ago, uh, once we got through it, it took us about another year to implement them. And again, if we hadn't done it, they wouldn't have. I mean, we convinced the largest operators in Colorado that this was in 
their best interest long term because they had a social contract with the citizens of Colorado. They're, Colorado's a beautiful state. There are a lot of people there that don't think we should have any oil and gas, right? They think, think all fracking should be banned, which essentially is taking, is taking somebody's private property. In other words, all that, those resources in the ground are owned, many of them, by senior citizens as part of their retirement. But the, the anti-fracking individuals, they don't care. They, just, they don't want to have any oil and gas anywhere in the state. And I think getting methane regulations done helps the oil and gas industry demonstrate that, that they care about the environment and they care about cl the clean air and clean water. And I think that was, there's no way to have done that fast. So I think, John, uh, we'll ask, that brings up a good point. I mean, sometimes you take positions that might be seen as you know, unpopular within the Democratic Party or elements of it, right? Like fracking and... Well, I tell these, I tell, yeah. I tell really? that, we're, that we're not in China. We're not yeah. in Russia. You yep. can't walk up and take someone's private property without giving them some, some form of fair compensation. Exactly. That's good. Switching to marijuana now. Sorry, oh, no. that Sorry. took a long time. That took a long time. <laughs> Usually it's first. Usually uh, first. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a referendum. Uh, it was in a referendum that you opposed. So I think it's kind of interesting because you opposed it, but it got passed. So, I mean, how do you kind of internalize this is something I'm against, now I've got to implement it and do it in a responsible way? And Well, I was against it because you don't want to create something from scratch if you don't have to, and you don't want to be in conflict with federal law. Yeah. Plus, I think we had legitimate concerns about a spike in consumption, especially a spike in teenage consumption. When, yeah. when kids' brains are growing rapidly, really up to the age of 23 or 24, this super high intensity, I mean super high THC marijuana, every scientist I've talked to feels there's a, 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 a real probability that you could lose a sliver of your long-term memory every time you use it if you're a teenager. Wow. So we were very concerned, but... You know, and if I'd had a magic wand after the vote, I would have waved it and reversed the vote. But now we're four years into it, and, you know, I have to say that the things we most feared haven't happened. We didn't see a spike in consumption. We saw a slight increase among kids, but now we've got, you know, $200 million of tax money. We spent $10 million advertising on social media and TV to tell kids this is why it's such a bad idea for them. So kids have come back down. There are actually less teenagers smoking marijuana now than there were before we legalized it. Uh, we didn't see a spike in the general public. The, the only place we saw a spike in consumption or a significant increase in consumption, senior citizens. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Now, Just I'm saying. not saying that they could be going back to their childhood in the 60s. Or maybe it's you know arthritis and the, and the pains are growing old. Uh, but that's one thing. But we haven't seen a jump. Or we don't think we've seen a jump in, in driving while impaired. And if I had that same magic wand now, I'd put it in the drawer. I th I, I'm not quite there where I'm coming out and saying other states should go and do this. I've told governors pretty consistently, let's wait a little bit. This is, this is going to be one of the great social experiments of the, of the 21st century. Let's gather data and really be certain about this because there's a lot riding. But I don't think you can argue that the old system was a train wreck, right? We sent millions and millions of kids, most of them African-American or Latino. Uh, we sent them to prison, made them felons. In many states, they can't vote. Uh, for what purpose? And, and again, now that we've legalized it, we don't see a spike in consumption, so. Yeah, no, that's great. I think uh, Theresa May may, may may want that magic wand for Brexit. <laughs> wave, wave her referendum away. So we've got time for one more question from the audience. Uh, I see a person there. Yep. Hi there. Um, so I wanted to make a point about the role of government. Sure, they move slow, but they can also make investments in areas where business doesn't see an immediate profit. And in particular, Elon Musk and all of his work, they're standing on the, on the shoulders of giant, those from NASA and JPL, for example, the gentleman before. So what is Colorado investing in? You mentioned your innovation network. What are you investing in? So we are, well, I'll, first I'll just echo and amplify what you said, that, that we need government to make more investments. And you look at the cutbacks we've had in research and you look at, and even in, in, in uh, branches of, of science like medicine, the, a, f a friend of mine told me uh, a couple weeks ago that dementia and Alzheimer's, by I think, the, I think he said by 2040, 
we will be spending a trillion dollars a year on taking care of and providing medical care for people who are suffering from one or uh, of a variety of forms of dementia. And, and yet, the pharmaceutical companies, are, it, it's such a long shot, and there are really relatively few of them investing real money in trying to find a solution to that. Yeah. And that's the role of government, to, to go out there and say, all right, what are the most prom promising avenues? How do we do it? So we are doing, uh, we are doing some investing in the uh, uh, intellectual infrastructure surrounding marijuana, using our tax revenues. Uh, we are investing. We will have, by the end of 2022, uh, high-speed broadband in every town, every county, every municipality in the entire state of Colorado. We think that is the responsibility of the urban core and the suburban core to use their, their extra resources to, to make sure opportunity is equal in every part of the state. Uh, you know, mostly things like that, it, real infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, uh, water infrastructure, the things that people can't do on their own. I think it's good, and I saw firsthand in the rebranding exercise how your administration did a really good job of bringing in the rural areas, because usually urban areas always went out, rural's forgotten, and there were some really uh, interesting, intense discussions, actually, but it, there was, it was equality. We'll have, it was very powerful. I think, and I think one big issue for the country is we, when we did automation and, 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 and became, you know, when you did globalization, we left behind a huge number of our citizens, and they lost their jobs. And we sent them down to get a, you know, a six-hour, eight-hour tutorial on how to write a resume and, and go out and get you know, three times a week or five people a week that you ask for a job. That was the, that was the ticket. That's a joke. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's government malpractice. Uh, and I lived through that, right? I, I had all that process. And there's got to be a better way. We've got to ramp up training and go way beyond that uh, at a level that we've never even imagined before. It's got to be a life full of skills. Okay. Well, we're running out of time, so thank you, John. It's been fascinating. I think, you know, something that uh, Chris Gebhardt was talking about last night at dinner was that for real change to happen, people have to feel something first. And I think when you talked about that, you know, the collaborative nature that you espoused both in the mayoral election and governor was that there was a real hunger in the community for that. And I think that's, uh, it shouldn't be any surprise because most people do want to collaborate and be with each other. I mean, I do like, what was that friendly friction? I think that's an interesting collaborative technique. That's uh, an awkward phrase. It is days. an awkward phrase, a very awkward phrase. But, you know, building community and actually being intentional about it, uh, I think is very important. So uh, thanks again for being with us, and I know you've got a busy schedule. You guys are going to have a great few days. Thanks, John.